All right, let's open to Luke chapter 9, if you would, please. Luke, Luke chapter 9. I'm going to read a handful of verses before we pray this morning. Luke 9. We're going to backtrack slightly. Start reading in verse 46. I do not have a message today that is directed primarily at mothers, although I do think they embody the theme of this message. I'd like to preach to you this morning a sermon entitled, How May I Help You? And I think, as I say, mothers do fit that, that role very, very well, exemplify this topic. But uh, much broader scope today, every Christian ought to have that attitude of how may I help you. Luke 9, verse 46, then there arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be greatest. And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a child and set him by him and said unto them, whosoever shall receive this child in my name receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me, receiveth him that sent me. For he that is least among you all, the same shall be great. Now on the heels of that, we we preached about that last week, we get into verse 49. As John is hearing this lesson, it says in verse 49, John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him because he followeth not with us. And Jesus said unto him, forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. And then we move ahead a little bit. A few days go by. We're not exactly sure how many days, but they're on their journey. And it says, it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. So mind you, he's leaving Galilee and he's beginning his slow march towards the cross. Now, there's still many months left before he makes it to the cross, but now the primary focus of his ministry is no longer in the north, in Galilee. It's going to go down south to Jerusalem. In verse 52, it says, And sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? What a moment. But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. So with that, please bow your heads and pray along with me. Father, help us this morning. Thank you how you've already worked today. Thank you for the wonderful singing. Thank you that one glad morning we're going to fly away. And until that time, we desire to continue to fellowship with you and with each other and to do it, uh, Lord, in the power of the Holy Spirit. So please speak to us now and, and be in the midst of us, Lord. Let us recognize your presence. Make us into the servants you desire us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Several years ago, before I got saved, and even a little bit after I got saved, I worked a secular job. My first real job, if I can say it like that, was uh, working at a McDonald's. And uh, this is normal in America. Most most teenagers do get a fast food job of some nature. And oh my goodness, I worked my way up. My my first job at McDonald's was toasting buns. Oh, all day long, the buns, just buns, buns, eight hours in a row, toasting buns, put them in the toaster, take them out of the toaster, put them in the, oh, oh, I got so, when I got promoted to the meat station, I thought, yes, I've made it. (laughs) Finally, after some months, they put me down in what we called the window. It was a little box where you take orders from the drive-thru. I wore the headset, much like I'm wearing now. I wore a headset all day long, eight to 10 hours a day. And I, maybe you've had this job before. You'll be familiar with this wonderful experience. As soon as a car pulls up, there's a sensor in the ground. Sometimes it's in the, the menu board, but many times in the ground. When a car pulls up, it, there'll be a loud ding in the headset. And go, ding, so you know someone's there. And that tells you, push the button, start talking. Hello, welcome to McDonald's. May I take your order? I mean, I, I, I had nightmares of that ding. Because in a busy day, right, they just nonstop, ding, 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 oh, my soul. You know, you're okay if, you know, first 30 minutes of your shift, hour of your shift, you're okay. But then you get a few jerks coming through drive through and people just being difficult. Then you always get that guy 
who showed up in the drive-thru, ding, hi, welcome to McDonald's. May I take your order? Yeah, give me a minute. Dude, it's McDonald's. You really need to look at the menu for a minute? <laughs> Didn't, don't you know? You knew you were coming to McDonald's. Think about this. Before, and, you know, I'm just getting frustrated for no reason sitting there <laughs> dealing with difficult people. Nevertheless, the, the job description is, is customer service. No matter how difficult they are, how may I help you? Right? How may I help you? I, I moved from McDonald's. I worked my way up. I got into management. And then I got recruited by another fast food restaurant. Maybe you're familiar with it. It's called Taco Bell. Their famous line is, make a run for the border. So I did. And, <laughs> and uh, Taco Bell is one of the best things God ever created. That's, that restaurant is just Oh, oh, so good. Mexican food, it, it'll, it's not good for you, but man, it tastes good. It's just buy a lacquer where it's, it's worth the trip to America. So I, I, I start working. <laughs> it is. It is. It's, it's one of the first things I eat whenever I visit home. So I, I got to Taco Bell, and of course, it's the same system. Ding, hi, welcome to Taco Bell, my techie order. What's bad is when you forget where you're working. <laughs> Ding, welcome to McDonald's. Taco Bell. <laughs> That's not so great. Sometimes you do forget whose side you're on. Sometimes you do. And then I got recruited by Burger King, which you're all familiar with. And so I actually moved to a different state, took a job at Burger King. There it was a 24-hour restaurant. So I mean, at two in the morning, I'm dealing with oh, some difficult people. Hi, welcome to Burger King. My take your order. I had one guy in the drive through bless his heart, and I mean that. He went, oh, oh. I said, Sir, you okay? No, I'm, uh, I said, sir? And then nothing. I thought, okay, well, he drove off. A couple minutes later, he accidentally ran his van into the building. He had a heart attack and died in our drive through That didn't look good in the paper the next day. Man dies in Burger King drive through That just, that hurt business. <laughs> No matter who comes through, that ding goes off. As soon as that ding is there, it's an opportunity to serve. Oh, you know, as a young person, that's fine. I worked my way up. I was in management, so I was getting paid fairly well for a young man. But then you get tired of burgers and fries and grease and customers. And <laughs> you, so I thought, well, let me get a job at a bigger place. So I applied at a credit reporting agency called TRW. They later got bought out by Experian and massive, massive company. And they put me through the training, and now I'm going to help customers with their credit reports. And here I am sitting at my cubicle. Guess what my job was? I had a headset on, and the phone calls would come in. And I sat there eight to ten hours a day answering phone calls from angry consumers. Ding! Thank you for calling Experian. My name is Mike. How may I help you? How dare you turn me down? I'm mean, all day long angry customers. I couldn't get away from the ding, how may I help you? So now it's, I'm Pavlovian's dog. You know, I've been trained. When I hear the ding, oh, how may I help? <laughs> so if you guys ever need some assistance, just ring a bell and I'll come running. Yes? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Your pastor comes pre-trained. <laughs> how may I help you? When I was working at McDonald's as, as a manager, one thing that I started, I thought, you know, when you go to a fancy restaurant, I don't think McDonald's is fancy, by the way, but when you go to a fancy restaurant, one thing that makes it fancy is somebody will come by and use some wisdom, but, but check on you and say, everything going okay? Got everything you need? Can I help you? Great. Okay, good. Now, don't linger, right? You're not there to make best friends with them, but check on them. So I started something called the lobby check, and I, I trained a few employees to do it, some that were a little more personable, that wouldn't be so awkward, and every 30 minutes or so, I would send somebody from, from the back of the house out into the lobby to check on the customers. Sometimes I would do it myself. Just go around, everything good? Got enough? You want a refill? Can I bring you anything? You want some dessert? Anything? Just check. No other fast food restaurant in town did it. And when you know our sales started to go up and up, and that's how I got recruited to go to the next restaurant because I had started something new. The whole idea behind that is a simple thought, looking for opportunities to serve. Looking for opportunities to serve. And I believe that is the overarching thought of what Jesus is trying to teach his disciples in these three stories that we have, these three scenarios that we've read about. It is, how may I help you? That's the attitude he's trying to get stuck into the heads 
and hearts of his disciples. Now, verses 46 to 48, as I said last week, we preached out of that, so I'm not going to linger long, but let me just refresh your memory and move on quickly from this. First of all, when we talk about looking for opportunities to serve and that attitude of how may I help you, don't ignore the least among us. Don't ignore the least among us. The disciples had that idea of who's going to be the greatest. So naturally, if that's your idea, self-promotion, then you are going to help people who will build your reputation. That will, by helping them, make you look good. You scratch their back, and then in return, they give you some great reputation, some great recognition. You get thrust into the limelight. Jesus taught them that even a child, the least among them, is worthy of their greatest efforts. The attitude, even for those people that have nothing to offer you in return, you'll never even be recognized for doing what you did. Still more, the attitude towards that least among them is, how can I help you? What can I do to improve your life specifically, and most especially, help you get closer to God? I think this, this is a true statement. I think you understand what I mean when I say this. Children are not the focal point of our church service. Right? They are not the focal point of the ministry. You understand that. We don't gather on Sundays just for children, but we certainly accommodate that because they are part of our church family. So we have classes, we have events, we have youth Bible club. We, we don't want to, uh, to push them to the side and say, listen, when you get older, then you'll be important. Even now, let's, let's give them our best effort, but in a balanced way. We understand they're not the focal point, but nevertheless, feed my lambs. The least among us deserve that same attitude of how may I help you? You know what's interesting? We're in Luke 9. By the time we get to Luke 18, there are some moms and dads bringing their infants to Jesus, not to be sprinkled, not to be baptized, but to be blessed. That's why we have baby dedications. It, it falls in line with what Jesus was doing during his ministry. They brought the infants. You know what the disciples did? Oh, take that, get that baby away. And they forbid the mom and dad from bringing the infant to Jesus. And Jesus had to rebuke them. And he said, hey, hey, forbid them not. Suffer the little ones to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of God. He had to remind them of this lesson. And I, guys, I think it's fair. We need to be reminded often that service is... Let's not be selfish when we serve. So I'll help you as long as you can add something to my life in return. That's not the service that Christ is trying to get into us. The attitude is, how can I help you regardless of what you can give back to me? Think of this. Mom and dad bring their little baby. All they're looking for is a moment of Jesus' time just to bless the child. Just, we, we want you to know that this, we believe in you, we want to raise this child in, in a way that would please you, and we want your blessing on our child and on our family. What's wrong with that? What's wrong? Nothing's wrong with that. Now think of it like this. Mom and dad come, the disciple goes, go ahead, go ahead, shoot, shoot, shoot. And Jesus says, stop, no, 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 wait, bring the child. How special do you think mom and dad felt going away? Jesus didn't stop his ministry and set up a tent and go, okay, for the next week, we're just going to talk to you. He didn't, he didn't get to some extreme with it, but he took a few moments to do what he could for the least, literally the least among them. Imagine the difference it made in the life of that mom and dad, knowing that Jesus cares even about the little ones. Let's be careful also to have that attitude, looking for opportunities to serve even if it's just a little one. Now, verse number 49, we've talked plenty about that, so like I said, don't want to linger. Verse 49 to fi and 50, we, we have a different category, if you will. We have not a fellow laborer, but a laborer, All right? So point one, how may I help you that is the least among us? Point two, how may I help the laborers? How may I help laborers. And I, I want to unpack this a little bit because this man presents a unique situation. He is not a fellow laborer. You, do you see this in the story? He's not part of their group. Is he laboring? Is he doing something for the Lord? Yes. Yes, he is. But he's not a fellow laborer because he's not walking step by step for, with, with the disciples. So he's not a fellow laborer. 
but he is certainly laboring. Now, what group was he with? I don't know. John doesn't know. You know why? John didn't take time to find out. He saw the guy casting out devils in Jesus' name. and just said, whoa, 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 you're not one of us. You can't do this. Stop that. And that was it. You see, on the heels of what Jesus was teaching, that you need to be ministering, you need to receive people, big or small, and if you receive them, you receive me, and if you receive me, you receive my Father. So with that connection, John now remembers, ooh, we saw this guy doing something in your name, and instead of receiving him, we rejected him. Instead of helping him, we pushed him away. So I think John is actually asking in a, in a roundabout way, did we handle that incorrectly? And Jesus is going to now point out to him, listen, he's not against us. That guy that you forbid, he is not the enemy. So you shouldn't treat him like one. So a couple of ideas. Perhaps he was a follower of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was telling people Jesus is the Christ. So perhaps this guy was on his way leaving, let's say, John the Baptist church, trying to make his way towards Jesus' church, if you want to think of it as groups. And, and he, he wasn't quite assimilated yet into Jesus' group, but he was getting there. And he just wanted to be a part of it. Maybe it's that. What if it's this? What if this guy was in the crowd one day when Jesus was preaching and saw Jesus casting out devils, and that guy was so touched by what he saw, he thought, I want to do that too. The apostles were out on a preaching tour. Remember, remember this at the beginning of the chapter? They had gone out two by two. What if this guy saw the apostles doing that and said, hey, they're casting out devils in the name of Jesus. They're helping people. I want to help people too. So they thought, okay, yeah, let, let me see. They go home and they find people that are hurting and people that are suffering with unclean spirits and I command you in Jesus' name, and, and sure enough, God had not called them to that ministry, but God honored their efforts, and they were legitimately casting out devils in Jesus' name. So I'm not sure what the backstory is to this guy. All I know is this. He didn't go to the same Bible school, and he wasn't a member of the same church as John, but he wasn't doing anything wrong. I know that. Now, let's take a moment because, I, I, and I want to get a little bit of learning into you in the middle of this sermon. I want to do a little teaching if that's all right. Because there's a mistake that gets made here. This passage is used, I think, in an improper way because people will say, well, you see there, it doesn't matter what you believe. Doctrine, good teaching doesn't matter as long as you believe in Jesus to whatever capacity and as long as you do it in his name. So you say his name correctly. <laughs> then it's okay. And therefore, it doesn't matter what denomination you are, what church you go to, none of that matters. That's not what Jesus said. He didn't say that certain things weren't important. He just is pointing out you shouldn't have forbade this man. So, so let's, let's not get to the other extreme to go, oh, well, you see, then teaching and understanding the Bible properly and practicing the Bible properly is, you know, it's a subjective thing. We can all just do it however we want. That's not true. Just listen, listen to these couple of verses here. Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, listen to this part, Ye that work iniquity. But they were doing miracles. And they were doing it in Jesus' name. You see how Jesus teaches us that just because they said the name, that doesn't make it right. And it does matter. Not only what they're teaching, but why they're doing it, their intentions, how they went about it. Those things are important to the Lord. If somebody is doing good things for a bad reason, you need to rebuke them. That needs to be pointed out. And, and that's the problem. Jesus saw that there were people saying, Lord, Lord, it sounded good on the outside, but they had the wrong motives for doing those things. That's iniquity. Your light has become darkness. You're using the name of God to create a business and an income for yourself, that type of thing. They're trying to achieve fame and become great by using the name Jesus and miracles. 
which happens all the time. And that, Jesus said, is wrong. So we do need to draw the line. The Apostle Paul wrote, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. It does make a difference what people teach, believe, and how they practice their faith. It is, it is important. Can I ask you to hold your place in Luke and just flip over to Revelation chapter 2. A little bit of learning here in the middle of the sermon, and then we'll get back to preaching. Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 2. Revelation 2 and verse 2. Jesus says here, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. They wouldn't put up with it. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them what? Liars. Liars. Said, you guys are lying. God didn't send you to say that and do that. They tested these people. So they didn't just take anybody saying anything and doing anything in the name of Jesus and said, yeah, as long as you said the name, you're, you must be okay. They weren't that gullible. Jesus said, well done that you guys test this stuff. You try the spirits to see whether it's of God. You search the scriptures daily to see whether these things are so. And when you find somebody lying, you mark them and say, no, no, that guy's lying. That's not right. Do, do, you, see, do you see how Jesus is on board with that? Look at verse 6. But this thou hast, Jesus is complimenting the Ephesian church, this thou hast, that thou hatest the, what? Deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. There are certain deeds that Jesus hates. Now, deeds, right? That's how you practice something. Look at verse 15. Jesus says, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Jesus said, there's a couple things that are very important to me, doctrine and deeds, what you believe and how you practice that. And he says, I hate how the Nicolaitans go about it. To, to understand the Nicolaitans, that's a different sermon. I'm just pointing out to you that Jesus very clearly emphasizes the importance of good doctrine and good deeds that come from that doctrine. Right? Are we good with that? Now, let's come back to Luke chapter 9. And let's see how this fits into our story now. Verse 49, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him because he was teaching and practicing that incorrectly. Is that what it says? It's not what it says. L look at their reason for forbidding him, because he followeth not with us. He's not a member of our church, so we told him to stop. That's not a good reason. That's not a good reason. What did the man say wrong? Nothing. What did he do wrong? Nothing. There's no indication. You, you didn't take time to get to know him enough to realize if he had good or bad intentions, if his motives were right. You just jumped to an unfair conclusion that because you don't sit next to me on Sunday mornings, then you must not be able to serve like me. And that's not fair. God can use people in other churches. As long as they believe what's right and practice what's right, then praise God for what they're doing right. <laughs> what if the apostles would have approached him with this attitude? What if John found this guy, who knows, in the village, on the streets, wherever it was, doing this, and he stops him and says, oh, pardon me, sir, sorry, sorry, we, we haven't met, I don't think, I'm John, I, I, I've, uh, I'm a disciple of Jesus, I'm in his Bible school, he was. A roaming Bible school. Um, I'm, I'm just curious. I see you out here ministering to people and telling them about Jesus, and, and I've, I've seen you praying for people and casting out devils, and I, I'm just curious, where, where did you learn this? And, and hey, uh, can I invite you to come with us, and may, maybe you can come meet Jesus personally and, and, and visit our, our church, if you, if you will, and get to know. What if the apostles would have maybe taken this guy under their arm and said, hey, you obviously are interested in Jesus and helping people. That's what we're interested in too. How about we walk the same path, doing the same thing, doing, walk the right path, doing the right thing for as long as we can. 
What if the apostles would have approached this man with the attitude of, hey, how can we help you help others more? Why not approach him like that? Years ago, I was on a job site. After I'm in Bible school now, I got a job at McDonald's for a while, but then I switched over to painting. I had enough of the dings. (laughs) And I'm painting houses, and one day we're on a particular, in a house doing a renovation and finishing up on the painting, and one of the other contractors showed up, I think an electrician or something. Guys, I'll never forget it. The only time in my saved life that anybody has approached me to witness to me. My pastor was the first man, and then this guy was the only other person ever that has come up to me and offered me a gospel track or tried to have a spiritual conversation with me. The only one. I, I look like a painter that day. I got paint all over me, caulk, you know, the, the silicon. It's, I mean, I'm a mess. I look like a mess. And we're in the house together. We're packing up our paint to walk out. And this man, it was me and my boss, who was also a graduate of the same Bible school I went to. So me and my boss were there. And this guy walked in. We don't know him. And he can see we're about to leave. He said, pardon me, gentlemen. Sorry, before you go, can I leave this for you? And he handed us gospel tracts. And me and my boss was named Mickey, Mickey Pofel. I looked at Mickey and I thought, uh, this is backwards. <laughs> I, I didn't know how to react. I thought, uh, uh, my head was about to explode because I've never, I didn't know how it felt to be on the receiving end of this. And, and he could tell we were in utter shock. We just stood there in silence looking at these gospel tracts going, uh, what, what are you doing? <laughs> and he said, are you guys Christians? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we are. I, I thought, what, what do I say? And he said, well, great. Do you go to church somewhere? Yeah. <laughs> I'm in Bible school. We start talking and he asked for my testimony and I gave it. And, and he did it so well. He didn't just take my word for it. When I said I'm in Bible school, he didn't automatically assume I was saved. He said, oh, well, great, you're in Bible school, good. When did you get saved? I said, thank you. I liked it because that's, that's what I ask people. And I said, well, I got saved this day, this year, in this place, and I gave him the story, and he went, praise the Lord. That's excellent. And we carried on talking with that guy for 45 minutes. You know, to this day, I can't remember what church he went to. And we didn't discuss, you know, prophetic events and what Bible version he used, and we didn't discuss his mode of baptism or what style of music they have in their church or what preaching style their pastor have, has. I, I, you know what? I was just so impressed that somebody tried to witness to me. There was somebody doing the right thing at the right time. He had, I don't know if he had the other stuff right, but I know this. He had the Great Commission right. And I did not want to discourage him by, okay, well, let's pick on what we disagree on. Perhaps later, if God brings him across my path again, maybe we can discuss those things and perhaps get more truth on him. But for the moment, let's not discourage what he's doing. Let's say, praise God, we are laboring together for the Great Commission. That was thrilling. There's a a story that's slightly similar to this. You see, just like that electrician or whatever he was, he wasn't the enemy. He wasn't against me. He was on our side. We're on the same team. There's a guy in the book of Acts named Apollos. Remember this guy? Acts 18, he gets up to preach in a synagogue, and, and, and the Bible says he was mighty in the scriptures. He knew his Bible. But what was he preaching? The baptism of John. That's all he knew. Aquila and Priscilla, disciples of Paul, they went to the synagogue. They heard this fantastically eloquent speaker, Apollos, give the sermon. Afterwards, Aquila and Priscilla say, man, this guy, he didn't say anything wrong. He didn't. He didn't say anything wrong. He just didn't have all the facts. He didn't didn't know how that story was supposed to end. He had everything from, from Moses to John the Baptist. He needed somebody to come in and go, yeah, but the one John preached about, Jesus, he's come. The Messiah has come. And Aquila and Priscilla did what any good Christian should do. They invited him to mug and bean (laughs) and said, let's sit down and have a lekker cup of coffee and we will expound unto you the way of God more perfectly. Imagine if Aquila and Priscilla would have said, hey, 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 listen, stop it. You don't know what we know, so you stop preaching and let us do it. 
Oh, if they would have handled it like that and forbade Apollos, that may not have turned out so well. But because they handled it as, with this in mind, how can we help him? He's trying to do something right. Now, how can we help him do that better? He needs to know the end of the story. He needs to know Christ more perfectly. Now, that's a case where the guy wasn't saved and needed somebody to step in and help him have a full knowledge of what Jesus came to do. So understand, please, please get this right. Not everybody is against us. (laughs) Apollos wasn't against Jesus. He didn't know Jesus yet. We got to give him a chance. I wonder, this man that got forbidden here in in our story in Luke 9, I wonder if he ever joined the church in Acts chapter 2. You ever thought about that? I mean, here this apostle kind of shut him down out of nowhere. Hey, hey, stop preaching. Don't do that. I wonder if later on he said, came to the church, knocked at the door and said, hey, uh, is it okay if I join now? (laughs) Can, Can I come in now? Am I still forbidden or can I help? I wonder if he ever came back around. The apostles, listen, as disciples, the attitude is, how can I help? How can I help? And then lastly, we have this story from verse 51 down to 56. So there's the least among us. There's the laborers that perhaps need a little help, but still they're laboring. So let's be helpful. And then we have this crowd. This last bunch, the Samaritans, they are against Jesus. Now, now to be technically true or technically uh, forthright about this, the Samaritans were against Jews, not just Jesus. Samaritans and Jews were longtime enemies. It really wasn't racism as we know it now, but it's, it's a fairly close equivalent, biblically speaking. And when Jesus is about to, he's heading from Galilee down to Jerusalem, he has to cut through Samaria. That's the, that's the shortest way to get there. So Jesus sends a couple of disciples to a village. All Jesus wants to do is stop at a mug and bean on the go. Right? It, seriously, it's just a pit stop. He doesn't have long. He's not going to stay the night. Go make ready in one of the villages. I, I just need to have a meal, and then I need to get going. I've got to get to Jerusalem. So when the disciples show up in Samaria and say, listen, is there anywhere we can set up a meal? Oh, sure. Who are you with? Jesus. Jesus. We remember he's been here before. He had been. Remember the woman at the well? Jesus had spent time there before. But then they said, well, well, we we want him to stay the night. We want more teaching. No, no, no. We got to get going. We got to go to Jerusalem. You got to go where? Jerusalem. What's wrong with us? Why do you got to go to Jerusalem? Why can't you stay here in Samaria for a while? You know, we have a synagogue too. We have Mount Gerizim where we worship. Do you think your mountain's better than our mountain? You think your temple's better than our temple? And they got indignant. Over what? Over something silly. Can, can, I, can I make a blunt statement? Guys, racism is stupid. It's just stupid. Ra- racism is for people that are too lazy to think. Really, that's your problem. You're crippled too high for crutches. That's your issue. You're crippled too high for crutches. Because to, to say, because somebody is associated with this group, therefore everything they do is wrong, come on, come on. Stop and get to know the facts. Get to know the person. To assume, oh, he is going to Jerusalem, therefore he hates Samaritans. <laughs> That's not what's going on. Jesus doesn't hate Samaritans. Jesus just has a program that he's got to stick to. He's got a schedule. Samaritans, don't be so overly sensitive. Don't be so thin-skinned. Don't take this with any more weight than it ought to be taken. He just needs to get going. That's it. Don't assume this means that he's against you. But they assume that he's being disrespectful. So James and John, uh, they have a nickname. Alas Bainam is the son of Boanerges, the sons of thunder, way before Thor ever had it, (laughs) the sons of thunder. How'd they get that nickname? This story right here. (laughs) This is is what earned them that nickname. All right, so the Samaritans now, they've jumped to this very unfair conclusion. They're calling Jesus a racist. He's not. 
and they say, Jesus, listen, can we just burn them down? Can we just burn them down? I'm, we're so sick of this nonsense. Can we just, just call down fire? Listen, you said we could move a mountain. Calling fire down from heaven, doesn't that fall into that same supernatural category? If we just do it in your name, pow, pow. Just, and then they start quoting scripture at the Lord, like Elias. <laughs> Remember that Lord, Elijah did it. Elijah did it, can't we do it? We want to... You know, th th this is the danger when you get somebody that's really fired up. They just look for certain stories in the Bible and go, ooh, I want to do that. <laughs> Elijah, you, you remember the story where he called down fire from heaven. He, there was a king, ah Ahaziah. Ahaziah had fallen out of a window. Don't know how that happened. Fell out of a window. And now he's busy dying. And he sends messengers to go ask Beelzebub, am I going to die? At the same time, those messengers are sent out. The Lord God tells Elijah, taps him on the shoulder and says, hey, Elijah, go meet those messengers before they can, before they can get to their temple and tell them that Ahaziah is going to die. So Elijah shows up, stops him on the way, says, pardon me, guys, I know you guys are going to go ask a certain question. I can tell you what the question is and the answer. Your master is going to die, just so you know, and he deserves it. <sighs> Off he goes. So those messengers come back and they're back a bit early. King says, what's going on? How, how'd you guys get back so quick? Well, this prophet showed up and said that he'd heard from God and you are going to die. And the king of Hazai said, uh, tell me what this guy looked like. Oh, I tell you, we'll never forget. He was a hairy man. <laughs> and he had on a leather girdle and, yo, know, that guy, I mean, he was, he, he looked kind of freaky. What'd you say his name was? John the Baptist? No, no, not John. He was Elijah. <laughs> And the king said, yeah, I know that Elijah character. He gave my daddy Ahab quite a bit of trouble too. So Ahaziah says, what's this business about me dying? That can't be right. He sends a captain of his army with 50 men to Elijah. And they stomp, brum, 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 boom, stop there at the prophet's house. The king calleth thee, come down. Come down, man of God. And Elijah said, if I be a man of God, let fire come down. Wha-bam! 51 dead people. <laughs> Little puff of smoke. <laughs> and Hezekiah looks out that window and says, oh, good grief. <laughs> hey, you, take 50 more. <laughs> and you tell that prophet to knock it off and get down here quickly. And here comes that next messenger. Vroom, 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 vroom. Man of God, come down quickly. And this time he adds quickly. And Elijah said, if I be a man of God, let the fire come down quickly. Wham! 51 more dead people. <laughs> Puff of smoke. As I looks out the window and says, oh, good night, nurse. Oh, here we go. Elijah's already wiped out 450 prophets of Baal. Remember, he called fire down. So this is not, it's, there's a precedent to this. He turned them into a nonprofit organization. Bam! Just like that. So now Ahaziah looks out the window, puff of smoke, say, yay, 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 yay. Yutta. <laughs> Yutta. You. You. And that's where all the captains are looking. He's talking to you. He's talking, no, he's not talking to me. He's talking to me. <laughs> no, no, you, captain, take 50 more. Go get them. Bring them now. All right. And this time it's not vroom, vroom, vroom. This time it's. Easy, guys. Easy. <laughs> Don't tick him off. <laughs> He's having a rough day, obviously. <laughs> easy, guys. Easy. And they go up and real gentle. Uh, pardon me, sir. Ma man, uh, Mr. Mr. Man of God. M Mr. Sir. Do doctor. Do uh, <laughs> however we greet you, oh, oh, man of God, listen. We know you're a man of God. We're not questioning that. Oh, we're not questioning that. You don't have to prove it. We believe it. 51, 50, there they are. We believe it. <laughs> the proof is all around us. You done bride our friends. <laughs> if you would be so kind, please, sir, please, would you come with us? The king just has a couple of questions. That's it. There's just a couple of questions. We're not done anything. And the, and the Lord told him, there's, there's an angel there involved, says, yep, you can go with them. That, that'll be fine. 
So Elijah goes down, has the interaction with the king, says, listen, king, you sent messengers to go talk to Beelzebub. God was way ahead of you. Listen, man, you're going to die, and you deserve it. And he was very bold. He didn't back off of the message. There is, listen, there is a time to call the fire down. There is a time to take a stand and say, King, you're wrong and you deserve what you're getting. You can't mock God when you sow, you're going to reap, and that's how it is. We're not against those times in life when you got to call for the fire. Jesus is not against what Elijah did, right? When these guys said, can we do like Elijah? Jesus did not say Elijah was wrong. There's a time and a place for such things. Jesus was pretty good at calling down some quote-unquote fire. When he talked to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, he said, ye bunch of hypocrites, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Don't think he said that in a nice soft tone either. <laughs> you can't say that, you're going you're gonna to burn in the damnation of hell. You, you can't say that nicely. He put his foot down. You know what he said to those Jews at one point? He said, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because no truth in him, and he's a liar and the father of it. And they said, tell us this, tell us that. He said, if I were to say those things, I'd be a liar like unto you. Jesus knew how to put his foot down. Have you read the story in John 2 where Jesus took time to make his own whip and then went into the temple and run, rushed out the money changers? And the animals, I mean, he knew how to put his foot down. Jesus had some zeal. He was a man, a man, the man of God. But let us be careful not to confuse boldness with being a bully. Jesus knew how to be bold. He knew when to be bold, but he was not a bully. He's not going to use his God-given power just to prove to other people how strong he is. Not to just take out some personal vengeance because he himself was offended somebody didn't like him. Jesus is there to help, not to hurt. Verse 56, the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. You know what you got to do sometimes? Somebody's done you wrong? Because this is where the story gets the most challenging. How may I help you? Well, if you're at my restaurant going to give me money, I'm all for helping you because you brought me money. But what if all they do is bring you attitude? What if all they do is bring these false assumptions and these accusations and start calling me a racist and me a bigot and me this and that? Ho, ho, ho. How are you going to say these things about me? You don't even know me. You don't know why I'm going to Jerusalem for this and that. I'm nothing against you. Even there, what's our attitude? I'm looking for an opportunity to serve. These people are against us, so what do we do for them? We don't burn them to the ground. We don't let fire proceed out of our mouth and hurt them because they hurt us, and well, that's just fair play. You know, he said something ugly to me, so I got him, I got him back. I, zing, I give him a good zinger. Well, now you just stoop to his level. Now you're just down there with him. The attitude remains, how may I help you? And, and, and if they need a stiff rebuke, if you need to put the hammer down, Okay, maybe that's what they need on those rare occasions. But be careful. You're not just trying to achieve vengeance for yourself. Be sure that what you're saying to them is ultimately for their benefit. How may I help you? You know the best thing you can do sometimes when somebody's giving you attitude and they will not listen to reason, no matter what you say, no matter how you try to convince them otherwise, here's the best thing you can do. Watch, watch, watch. Here you are in Locked in the conversation, they're being ridiculous. What you do is this, you just go somewhere else. <laughs> Isn't that what Jesus did? Yeah. He went to another village. He said, guys, listen, they're unreasonable. We can't work with them. So here's point number three, leave them for later. How may I help you? That applies to the least among us. How may I help you? That applies to people that are laboring, even though they're not exactly the same as you. How may I help you? That applies to people that you need to leave alone for now. You'll come back to them later. Take your Bible. Come to Acts chapter 8. Let's finish up there. Acts chapter 8. It 
sometimes the best thing you can do is walk away. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be like unto him. That's, that's Proverbs chapter 26, verse 4. You know what the next verse says? Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceits. There is a time to speak up and say something, but your first inclination is to just leave it. Jesus said to these disciples, you know not what manner of spirit you're of. We're not here to be warriors and thump our chest and prove how strong we are and defend ourselves. We are here to help. The spirit you are of is your inclination, your proclivity. What are you inclined to do? My attitude is I want to help you, not hurt you. So Jesus grabbed hold of the sons of Boanerges and held them back and said, guys, just move on. This same John, it was James and John, right? This same John shows up in Samaria about a year later in Acts chapter 8. Look at verse 25. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Philip had shown up in Samaria, preached this preach the gospel, great revival breaks out, and then Peter and John come in to see what's going on, and they begin laying on hands, and the work of God is building up, and as Peter and John go back home, they stop in all these villages and preach the gospel there. How do you think this story would have been possible if James and John would have burned it down? If they had called down the thunder and called down the fire... It would have shut this door to the Samaritans probably permanently. But because they left them for later, they have a chance to go back and say, how may I help you? I know you were... John didn't show up and go, why were you ugly to my Savior? He said, how can I help you now? Our attitude, guys, as we go out throughout this week, how may I help? Look for opportunities to serve. The least the laborers, and even the ones you got to leave for later. Look for an opportunity to serve. Let's all stand, if you would, please. Heads bowed and eyes closed. In just a moment, the pianist will play. As the piano plays, take, take a few moments now. We'll not stay long, just... Check your heart. Ask yourself, is that my attitude? Do I have my dial turned to being a servant? Am I looking for opportunities to help? Sometimes that's going to be much more difficult than others. Let's not, let's recognize who our enemies are. Right? And when we find an enemy, we need to pray for him. Right? That, that's, that's what we're taught to do. We don't burn him to the ground. We pray for him. But I don't think we have as many enemies as we think. There are lots of people in this town that love the Lord Jesus Christ, believe the Bible, trying to serve him. Perhaps there are some smaller differences we can just push to the side because they are, they are small. And maybe we can encourage them for the good labor they are doing. And let's not look past the opportunity to serve anybody, big or small, old or young, black or white. How can I help? My sermon will be assisted by your cell phones throughout the week. You're going to hear ding. And that'll remind you, how may I help? Every time you hear ding, how may I help? Some of you, I know your phone just never stops going ding throughout the week. Boy, you should be busy helping a lot. (laughs) How may I help? I want to be a servant in any situation. In just a moment, I'm going to...
pray and close the service. But perhaps you're here today and, and you're not against Jesus. But maybe no one has sat down and fully explained to you what it means to be saved. Today we'd like to help. So before you leave, if you have questions about that, I would be honored. You can just pull me aside privately, quietly. We'll, we'll go somewhere alone and just chat for a minute. I'd love to tell you how you can be saved and know it. Father, thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts today. Lord, thank you for being so patient with us. It's just something about how we're built. Something wrong with our attitudes. Change us, Lord. Please help us to have that mind, that attitude, that spirit that you had about you. Looking for opportunities to serve, to go about doing good. Lord, I, even the disciples we read about, you had to reteach these things to them. So thank you for reminding us today. And Lord, if anybody here is not saved, draw them in. Please, Lord, might this be the day that the gospel light shines clearly in their eyes and into their heart. Father, as we dismiss, I pray bless our time together with friends and family, but especially with the mothers. Let them have a wonderful day. Bring us back tonight for Bible school, ready to learn more from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, folks, have a great afternoon. Spoil your mothers. And Lord willing, we'll see you tonight.